Assalamu alaikum. This is uh, Dr. Mamoun Ahram. I'll be teaching you the second half of the biochemistry course uh, in this semester. Uh, we'll be starting with uh, fibrous proteins, then uh, globular proteins, and we're going to have several lectures on, on um, globular proteins. We'll be talking about myoglobin, hemoglobin. Uh, we'll um, talk about uh, hemoglobin in more details, uh, regulation and hemoglobinopathies. Uh, we'll talk about immunoglobulins and then we'll talk about enzymes. Um, many, many lectures on enzymes, um, introduction of enzymes, enzyme kinetics, regulation of enzyme activity, uh, cofactors, and then we will end with two lectures on uh, techniques, how to analyze proteins. And that would be it. So uh, let's start the fun. The idea here is that um, in these lectures, uh, the idea is to link what you have been taught about uh, enzymes, carbohydrates, and lipids with function. So uh, this is these lectures are more fun than the previous ones because now we will talk about, for example, why do proteins or a certain protein uh, has a certain amino acid. Uh, why is it that they have this amino acid at this particular position? Uh, what would happen if this amino acid changes to another one of a different type? Okay, so um, we'll start with proteins. So proteins have different functions. So you have proteins that function as enzymes, so, so they catalyze reactions, they, they speed up reactions. Uh, proteins can also function as transport proteins, so they can transport proteins uh, in blood, for example, outside of cells, or they can transport proteins into cells like channel proteins. They can also transport proteins inside cells, that is, they carry proteins from one uh, region of a cell to another. Uh, proteins can also function in contraction. Like in muscles, for example, the myosin plays a very important role in contraction. Then uh, we have proteins that are structural, and this is actually the topic of, of this lecture. Uh, structural means that uh, what they do is they maintain the structure of cells, like in actin, or they maintain the structure of, the, uh, of an organ, a tissue, or a whole organism, like bones in our bodies. Proteins can also function in defense, so like uh, antibodies or immunoglobulins. So it's basically the same thing, whether we say immunoglobulins or antibodies, okay? And uh, proteins can also function in signaling, so they, they transmit signals from outside of cells to, uh, to inside of, the, of cells. Now, um, uh, proteins can also function as toxins, like endotoxins. For example, so these different proteins have different amino acids, and and it's the amino acids that not only that they determine the structure of a protein, they also determine its function. Overall, proteins can be classified into two types. You can either have fibrous proteins or globular proteins. So fibrous proteins are proteins that are basically elongated, okay? So they have a, a uh, so they look like fibers, okay? And usually they are composed of a secondary structure uh, continuously like uh, alpha helices or a helical formation as in collagen. Now proteins, examples of such proteins uh, are uh, collagens, elastin, and keratins. Then we have globular proteins. The word globular uh, came from, from the word globe. Uh, so they look rounded, they look like a ball. They have a three-dimensional uh, structure. And overall, they are composed of several secondary structures. So it's not, a, it's not one continuous secondary structure, rather they are composed of alpha helices, a combination of different alpha helices interrupted by turns, um, or you can have um, 
combinations of secondary structures like several alpha helices and a number of uh, beta strands and so on. Okay. Examples include myoglobin, hemoglobin, and immunoglobulin, as well as enzymes, and we'll talk about all of these later on. So let's start talking about fibrous proteins. So basically the idea here is that we have cells, plasma membrane, they have receptors on, in the cell surf, on the cell surface, and then outside you have the extracellular proteins. So it's basically different types of proteins. Usually they are uh, elongated. They have alpha helices as secondary structures, continuous, usually. And uh, what they do, is, is several things. They maintain the organization of cells uh, in an organ or a tissue. They maintain the, the structure, the shape of the tissue. Uh, they connect cells to each other. They can uh, Signals can be transmitted from outside of cells to inside via these matrix proteins. Uh, the matrix itself uh, may function as a reservoir. So what you have in here is is that you have uh, nutrients, ions, uh, hormones uh, embedded or stored within the matrix. Okay, so among the different um, matrix proteins that exist outside of cells, you have the you have the collagen, and this collagen is really a large, elongated, thick uh, protein. So let's start talking about collagens now. Again, these collagens, uh, they are thick, elongated molecules. There are different shapes as well, but that's the typical uh, formation or structure of collagens. Now, so collagens are basically, they, they belong to a family of proteins. There are 40 different types of collagens um, in, in our system. Uh, in fact, collagens are the most abundant proteins. This family is the most abundant, uh, constitutes the most abundant uh, proteins um, in, in our system as a whole. So they, they uh, constitute 25% of the total protein mass. Now, usually they are named as type 1 collagen type 2 collagen type 3 collagen and so on their main function is to support tissues okay and as a result because their function is structural it's a, it's support like in bones for example their primary feature is stiffness so they are rigid tough molecules and and because of their stiffness uh, they provide tensile strength to tissue so what do we mean by tensile strength so it's basically they provide uh, strength um, against tension so the idea here is that when you have a tissue and you increase strain on a, uh, on a tissue you that consecutive you know, subsequently that increases uh, stress on that tissue and the tissue would go through several um, uh, consequences okay so you have uh, strain that would cause physiological loading so, I, so for example if you press on on your skin well that increases strain but nothing really happens to that skin right uh, if you stretch it for example nothing happens to that skin now if you stretch it too much that would cause micro trauma so it's injury that that you cannot notice but in fact if you look at it under the microscope you see that the the tissue is actually injured but then that would cause injury that can be observed and and then that reaches failure so that is uh the the tissue cannot withstand the the stretching or the tension okay So now the idea is how does collagen do that? How does it support tissues? So let's look at the structure of collagen. It's a triple stranded molecule, meaning that it is composed of three strands. 
and these three strands intertwine around each other so they are wound around each other okay and and the, there's the structure of the collagen strand, each collagen strand, which is known as the alpha collagen chain or collagen alpha chain, it's helical. So you have this helical structure uh, throughout the molecule. Now, the basic unit of the collagen molecule is known as tropocollagen. So each chain is known as an alpha chain. And when you have a, the, a combination of three alpha chains with each other, uh, that would form uh, a, the basic unit of the collagen molecule known as a tropocollagen. So these alpha chains are different. So for example, uh, you can have um, um, alpha 1 you have a collagen molecule made of alpha 1 chains three alpha 1 chains or you can have a, another uh, another collagen molecule is, uh, that is made of uh, two alpha 1 chains and one alpha 2 chain and so on so you have different combinations of alpha chains forming different types of collagen molecules so overall each chain is helical and the difference between the helical uh, uh, form conformation of the alpha chain versus the alpha helix that you learned uh, previously in the in the protein structure lectures is that the helical structure of the collagen alpha chain is more extended so there are less amino acids per full turn versus the alpha helix now so what happens here is that you have the tropocollagen and you have multiple tropocollagens that form uh, that uh, cluster with each other forming a microfibril and this and several microfibrils get together forming a fibril and this fibril structure can be observed under the electron microscope and then you have several fibrils uh, cluster with each other forming a fiber. Now all of these structures, uh, whether we're talking about micro, whether we're talking about tropocollagen, microfibril, fibril, or fibers, they can be cross-linked with each other covalently via uh, yeah, with uh, modified lysine residues. And we'll talk about that um, in a few minutes. So now let's zoom into the molecule. Now, so we talked about the overall structure of the collagen molecule. Well, let's talk about the amino acids that, um, that, that determine the conformation, the structure of the collagen molecule. What characterizes collagen is that it is rich in glycine. One third of all amino acids in collagen is basically a glycine. This is really large. Now remember, this is the structure of glycine. It's a small amino acid. It's the smallest amino acid. It has an R chain that is only a proton and that's it. Now collagen is also rich in proline. Okay. Now remember, so 13% of uh, collagen, the primary structure of collagen is a proline. Now remember that proline, it, has a, it forms a ring structure. It's a rigid molecule. Uh, it can, it, it's not flexible and it cannot form a hydrogen bond uh, at the, the alpha amino group, right? Now, the collagen molecule also is made of hydroxyproline. So we're talking about so nine percent of the primary structure of collagen uh, is is made of hydroxyproline. So here we're talking about uh, twenty percent of the collagen molecule is basically a proline or a modified proline. Um, so so this is the the um, the structure of the hydroxyproline. So you have a hydroxyl group that is attached to the R group. Now, think about it. What would a hydroxyl group do 
uh, to an amino acid residue. It can form a hydrogen bond. Keep that in mind. Now, proline also has, uh, sorry, collagen also has hydroxy lysine. So it's lysine, okay, uh, that can be possibly charged, but you have the addition of a hydroxyl group. Now, this hydroxyl group um, provides a reactive group uh, that is, um, uh, you can link molecules to it, and we'll talk about that as well. So the primary structure of a collagen, the typical primary structure of a collagen is basically glycine followed by any amino acid followed by any other amino acid. And usually what you have in here is glycine, proline, hydroxyproline or uh, glycine, hydroxyproline, proline. Okay. Now notice here, so this is the distribution of uh, the different amino acids that make up collagen. So one third is glycine, about 20%, which is also large, large number, um, is proline or hydroxyproline. Now notice that it also has nonpolar amino acids. That's a lot as well. So overall, if you look at the molecule, it's hydrophobic. Okay. Now notice these large uh, amino acids, tyrosine, phenylalanine, um, uh, they constitute a very small fraction of the primary structure of collagen. Uh, there is no tryptophan, the largest amino acid, and there is a reason for that. So let's get into the fun part now. Why is it that collagen has glycine and proline? Well, remember that glycine is the smallest uh, amino acid. That's one. The other thing is that it can rotate freely. So if you look at a collagen molecule, you would notice that this is, this is how the three alpha chains are connected to each other. And right in the middle, you see the glycine residue. So here you have glycine XY, glycine XY glycine xy you have the glycine residues embedded right in the center of the molecule so yeah this is a top view so if you look at at collagen as a cylinder and you look at it from from top you have the glycine embedded inside now the reason is that to to to, to pack the collagen molecule to have the three strands very very close to each other you need a small amino acid so it's almost like a rope really i mean you, you have a rope that is made of uh, of several threads and these threads interwine around each other and the the closer the threads are to each other the stronger the rope same idea with collagen now, the thing is, as well, is that you have the uh, strands forming a helical structure. So you need the strands to uh, rotate freely okay, around each other, and glycine helps in that. Having this uh, uh, small structure, um, uh, reducing uh, the, the repulsion of the R groups, there's no R group, so you have the, the strands uh, rotating around each other or interwining around each other. Well, what does form the helical structure? It's proline. Now, proline, what it does, remember, it's a rigid molecule, and what it does is that it creates kinks, tajat in hinaat. So. So remember when we said about, so, so someone might say, well, wait a second, you, you're confusing me. You told me before that proline breaks alpha helices. So usually it exists at the end of uh, alpha helices. And I said, yes, it does. So, so you would say, then how does it form an alpha hel or how does it form a helical structure in here? Well, because it creates these kinks. Okay, so what happens is that you have 
uh, you have a stretch of amino acids and you have a proline and it creates a kink okay allowing the the strand to rotate or to bend a little and then you have a stretch of amino acids and then you have a proline and here you have another kink and so on so the helical formation of collagen is really determined by proline because of the kinks that proline creates now because it is a rigid molecule sorry because it is because proline is a rigid amino acid that makes collagen as a whole a rigid molecule a rigid protein so proline provides rigidity to collagens well how about hydroxyproline in addition to uh, providing rigidity to the structure of the molecule remember that this hydroxyl group can would allow uh, hydroxyproline to form hydrogen bonds so what that would do is that you have these hydrogen bonds between the the three strands so not only that they are close to each other not only that the strands are close to each other they are packed because of the collagen because of the glycine the hydroxyproline uh, uh, creates these hydrogen bonds uh, getting the three strands even closer to each other now the significance of hydroxyproline can be illustrated in this plot right here so here you have the helical uh, content the percentage or fraction of helical content of uh, of a collagen molecule in a collagen in a normal collagen versus collagen that that has no hydroxyproline uh, at different temperatures so you can see that uh, the the normal collagen molecule would start to deteriorate it would the, the helical formation would start to be uh, uh, starts to be lost at high temperatures so the I don't know what the maximum temperature that we can handle is it 43 44 or so now see you notice that the the normal collagen would start to disrupt at, at these temperatures now if you look at the stability of a collagen molecule that has no hydroxyproline even um, at, at normal physiological temperature uh, the collagen molecule is really deteriorated it loses its helical formation so it's not stable anymore no well how about hydroxylysine the main purpose of hydroxylysine basically is to attach sugars to them okay so you have the the uh, conjugation of uh, residues like galact sugar residues like galactose and glucose to a hydroxylysine so that makes collagen a glycoprotein so what's the importance significance of these sugars well they provide a linkage between linkage points between collagen and cells so cells receptors on the cell surface can interact with collagen molecules with the matrix via these sugar molecules now this illustration is really oversimplification because the the interaction between cell receptors and collagen via the sugar molecules can also involve amino acids as well so it's really it's not only sugars uh, themselves so something else now what happens as well with uh, collagen is that the lysine residues can be oxidized by certain by a certain enzyme and what this enzyme does is that it oxidizes lysine so instead of having this uh, amino group uh, in the in the r group in the terminus of the r group um, you have an aldehyde now this molecule right here is known as all lysine or aldolysine okay now this creates a a group a reactive group that uh, can form covalent linkage between 
an all lysine with another all lysine or all lysine with a lysine or an all lysine with a hydroxy lysine so this is another purpose of hydroxy lysine so remember you have the three strands that are very close to each other they are packed because of glycine now the packing increases as a result of the formation of hydrogen bonds between the different hydroxyproline residues and you have this packing uh, increasing further as a result of the formation of these covalent cross links between the all lysine with the different types of lysine residues that makes the molecule very rigid very tough like a rope So if crosslink is inhibited, the tensile strength of the collagen molecule is drastically reduced. So it cannot really protect the tissue. It cannot maintain the tissue. So tissues that depend on the presence of, of collagen, like skin and blood vessels, they would be easily be torn. Okay. So uh, at the same time, if there is deficiency in hydroxylation, whether we're talking about hydroxylation of um, lysine or, or um, uh, proline, that would cause certain conditions such as the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Now, here is a, a, a funny fact. Now, cross-linking increases with age. Okay, so the older we get, the more cross-linking we have in our uh, collagen. Uh, molecules now the thing is the same is true with animals and this is the reason why we like to eat lamb versus uh, meat from uh, older sheep because it's harder to chew uh, um, meat from older animals whereas meat from uh, lamb for example uh, would, would be more tender Now, let's, so let's talk about uh, another disease here, uh, which is known as scurvy. Arabi is qarbut. Now, the idea here is that scurvy is caused by deficiency of ascorbic acid. So, what ascorbic acid does is that it is important for the function of certain enzymes, such as proline hydroxylation sorry proline hydroxylase this proline hydroxylase is is important for pro proline hydroxylation so what happens is that if there is deficiency of vitamin c this it means that this enzyme the proline hydroxylase is not functioning anymore meaning that proline cannot be hydroxylated so the collagen molecule becomes weaker it becomes fragile so um uh, symptoms or uh, symptoms um, linked to scurvy include loss of teeth because gum tissue cannot hold teeth in their sockets. Okay, this is why in pirates movies you have these pirates having uh, no teeth. Okay, so it's because they have deficiency of vitamin C. Why? Because they hardly eat fruits or I should say they hardly ate fruits. Uh, fruits cannot, like oranges and, and lemon, cannot um, cannot be stored for uh, for a long time. Uh, so these people, these pirates or sailors in general, uh, they do not have enough uh, vitamin C. So their collagen becomes weak as a result of that. So let's talk about a second type of uh, fibrous proteins, which is elastin. Now, if you look at a tissue, you have cells uh, scattered throughout this tissue, fibroblasts, endothelial cells, whatever. You have these collagen structures right here, the collagen fibers, which are thick fibers. You can see them in here. But you also have elastin fibers. These are the thin uh, strands that you see in here. So 
what is elastin? So elastin is a long protein that exists in tissues such as skin, blood vessels, lungs. So these tissues are tissues that can stretch. Okay, so what you have in here is that you have this elastin and this elastin network, okay, if you stretch it and you leave it, it goes back to its form, okay? Like um, uh, baby cheeks, we love to play and stretch baby sheets, yet they don't uh, get out into our hands, right? Uh, we do not tear skins no matter what we do. Why? Because of collagen. So elastin fibers allow us to stretch a tissue like baby cheeks, but the collagen maintains this tissue intact. Okay. So what elastic fibers do is that they provide resilience to tissues. Okay. Now, So the elastin, uh, elastic fibers are made of a protein known as elastin. Elastin is a highly hydrophobic protein. It is rich in proline and glycine. So why is it hydrophobic? Well, um, note that um, there are hydrophobic interactions between the different uh, strands. So if you stretch it, these strands would get to each other as a result of these hydrophobic interactions. Now it contains hydroxyproline, but it does not contain hydroxylysine. So what did we say about hydroxylysine? The main purpose of hydroxylysine in collagen is to attach sugars to it. Okay, and that makes collagen a glycoprotein. Now because there is no hydroxylysine in elastin, Elastin is not a glycoprotein. It doesn't get glycosylated. Now, but there are lysine residues, and these lysine residues allow for the formation of uh, covalent cross links between the different strands. So if you look at a primary structure of an elastin protein, it is basically composed of two uh, segments or regions. You have hydrophobic segments, okay, and these are responsible for the elastic properties, that is, for the stretching and, and um, getting the elastic fibers back to their uh, original conformation. And you also have regions that are rich in alanine and lysine, and this lysine is responsible for the covalent cross links between the different strands. So let's talk about the uh, third type of, um, of fibrous proteins, that is keratins. So keratins belong to a family of proteins that can be divided into two types. You have um, uh, alpha keratins and beta keratins. Now, alpha keratins are mainly made of uh, alpha helices as secondary structures. Beta keratins contain a lot of beta strands. We will focus on alpha keratins. These alpha keratins, well, overall, these uh, keratin molecules make up a, a large group of uh, proteins known as intermediate uh, filaments. Now, the alpha keratins are important because they make up our hair and fingernails. Now remember how we talked about collagen and, and we said that uh, collagens unusually contain hydroxylysine and hydroxyproline and we said that uh, elastin is all, also unusually contain um, hydroxyproline but there is no hydroxylysine. Well how about keratins, alpha keratins? They unusually contain a large number or high number, I should say, high number of cysteine residues. So think about it. What's the purpose of cysteine residues? What do they do? They form disulfide 
buns. So how do keratins look like? Well, they start with the formation of a dimer between two alpha helical chains. So you have e each chain is, uh, is mainly composed of alpha helices, and you have two of them getting together, forming a dimer. This is known as coiled coil dimer. You have two coiled coil dimers forming a tetramer, and these tetramers then associate head to tail. So you have these uh, tetramers getting together, forming this long uh, stretch of a molecule. Now, this is known as a protofilament. Now you have two protofilaments getting together, forming a protofibril. Now, then you have four uh, proto uh, protofibrils. So you have one, two, three, four protofibrils. Now each one of them containing two protofilaments. Okay, they get together forming the basic structure of intermediate filaments. Now, then these intermediate filaments, they get together forming a microfibrils. Microfibrils get together forming a macrofibril, and these macrofibrils then get together forming a single hair, um, just single hair. Okay, so you have single hair that is made of a structure known as macrofibril microfibrils are made of microfibrils microfibrils are made of cluster of intermediate filaments these intermediate filaments each one of them is composed of four protofibrils protofibrils are made of two protofilaments these protofilaments are made of dimers uh, of um, of these uh, alpha uh, keratin chains uh, uh, aligned next to each other. So one would say, well, wait a second. So you're telling me that fingernails and hair are both made of alpha keratins. And I say, yes. Then you would say, well, how is it possible that fingernails are hard, whereas hair is not? You can stretch hair. You can, you can um, twist it, but you cannot do the, the same with fingernails. And the reason is fingernails have a lot of disulfide cross links between the alpha keratin chains. Okay, so really it's the disulfide bonds between the chains that creates these uh, tough uh, solid structures that we see in fingernails versus hair. Well, let's talk about something else hair. Uh, I love this picture because um, it, it just shows you that uh, women would do anything to look beautiful. Well, men these days as well. Well, let's, so let's talk about hair design now. How is it that we can share, change our hair design for those who have hair? Okay. So, there are two things that we have to differentiate. We have the temporary wave, hair wave, and we have the permanent wave. So let's talk about the temporary wave. So the idea here is that uh, you wake up in the morning, you, your hair is, is a mess, basically, right? So what do we do? Uh, we wet our hair, and then we comb it. So why do we do that? Biochemically, we do that to break the hydrogen bonds between the uh, between the different hair. So the idea here is that you have these hydrogen bonds and you break these hydrogen bonds and then you uh, uh, redesign your hair. This is known as a temporary wave. So for example, you have uh, women, for example, let's say that you have a girl that is going to a party and what she does is that she takes a shower or she wets her hair and then uh, she rolls her hair and she dries it with a hair dryer. And then she removes the, these rolls and her hair now has a certain design, right? It's wavy. She goes to the party, she dances a lot, and she sweats. Now, or let's say it rains, whatever. So the idea here is that the design that she has is gone, it's ruined. 
because now we have reformation of these hydrogen bonds. Okay, so how about permanent waves? Well, this is what is known as perm. Okay, so the idea here is that you, you have reformation of the disulfide linkages between the alpha keratins. So you have this girl going to a salon and uh, she treats her hair with a reducing substance. So you have this breaking of the disulfide bonds. The, the all um, cysteines are now reduced. And then you have the hair uh, rolled um, or you have it uh, formed in a certain way. And then you have reoxidation. So you have reformation of, uh, of these disulfide bonds. And even if she takes a shower, the hair maintains its design because it's permanent. It doesn't get ruined because now we're talking about covalent bonds. Okay. Now, so how can she get rid of this uh, wavy hair? Well, by letting the the natural hair grow. Then you have this wavy hair right here in the bottom and you have the new flat or straight hair coming out uh, from her head. And this is what a perm is. Enjoy.